Mmm. Can I film a video with you? These guys. Oh, pets first. Pets first. Pets always gotta come first. <laughs> Alright guys, so this video is in response to your comments on my day one, part one with Bean here. I guess I was pretty shocked by how many of you had a lot of passion behind your comments and Really, the number one is that you guys did not understand why I didn't play SpongeBob for Bean. Uh, among other things, a lot of you argued that I should have put him in a cage, that I should have given him time to just settle and get used to my surroundings in a cage, um, and that I should have kept him on his old diet and given him something familiar, said the phrases that he was used to that Laura had mentioned to me, just all the things from his previous home to give him some familiarity and settle into my home better. Now, the interesting thing about that, that doesn't help a bird settle in any better. If anything, it just teaches the bird that new places are just like the old places. Whereas my day one, <laughs> you're just super into this. Uh, my day one is the most important day of taking on a new bird because it's a new environment, so there's new expectations. And he has no idea what to expect in my home. And there's fireworks going off right now. <laughs> You're handling it like a champ, because uh, obviously 4th of July. So uh, anyways, <laughs> oh, more pets. We don't care, we don't care. We're also getting reinforcement right now for being cool with the fireworks. So the point is, is that animals, just like humans, don't go through growth with unicorns and rainbows. It's not super smooth. It doesn't always look pretty. It's hard, it's difficult, it's emotional, it's scary, and they have to overcome that. And you don't get to overcome fear with having a just smooth transition right through it. So as you saw, he was experiencing a lot of fear and discomfort. And the way that we work through that is establishing new rules, new boundaries, and just new expectations. And so we bonded through the new diet, through the new food, offering him fun ways to interact with that food and, uh, and to interact with me as well and being that comfort to him. So if I would have triggered old habits, which I was told that he came from a home where he would constantly get scared and fly, and so that's why he was caged most of the time because he would do these flights that weren't very controlled. That's also why he ended up getting clipped in his old home. He was also scared of new people, so they stopped exposing him to the things that scared him. And instead of doing that, I prefer to desensitize. I prefer to slowly expose him to those new scary things to teach him to overcome his fear so that the next thing isn't as scary and is easier to overcome. So that's why in my day one videos, you see me, it is a lot. It can be overwhelming just to watch, to think, wow, he's in a totally new environment with new food, with new people, new things, and nothing is familiar. And that's where I like to become the comfort. I like to teach them that through training and through those interactions with me that I'm going to listen to you. And I'm gonna to listen to your body language and I'm gonna be receptive to what scares you, what makes you nervous, and I'm gonna help you overcome it so that it's no longer scary. I'm not gonna remove what is scary so that you never have to face it. I want you to become braver. I want you to become more desensitized and better and more independent and not need me to lean on or to be used as comfort so that you can just be brave and be a bird and be a functioning bird. And so a lot of the things that I'm working on with Bean in his series are just basic bird things. I want him to learn to accept and enjoy bathing. I want him to uh, enjoy tearing up toys. I want him to enjoy being outside among fresh air and natural breezes and sounds that will happen outside uh, that he will learn that aren't they aren't scary and they shouldn't scare him. Um, <clears throat> I want him to learn how to forage and how to self-entertain and 
I would really love to crate train him so that going in and out of a carrier is no big deal. These are things that most people need to be able to have their pet parrots do just on a daily basis so they can just function as a bird and they're just healthy things that a bird should do. Also eating a healthy diet, that's huge to me. If I bring home his old diet, which I did, um, we had your old food, you saw where I was keeping it. <laughs> um, so I do hang on to previous diets just in case as a, oh my gosh, sorry, my foot slipped. Um, as a, oh my gosh, you know, he's not eating, he's refusing to switch over, although I haven't actually run into that. Um, all birds have been a little bit different in their diet conversions, but I've been able to get every project bird that I've taken on switch over to a super healthy diet. And being it happened a little bit differently. It was a lot of social eating. He just enjoyed seeing what I was making, being a part of it. I handed him stuff that he had fun with the texture of just destroying it. Uh, so it was no longer eat this new diet. It was play with your food, have fun, socialize with me, be with me, um, but also have enough distance and space that he was really comfortable. But you also had something to do that was entertaining. Um, and that's an introduction not only to a healthy diet, but also to foraging. It's kind of a dual purpose. It's also teaching him to hang out with me in a positive way that is hands off because I'm all about force free training and permission based training. And that all means getting the bird's permission and invitation to interact with him. Uh, so anytime that he does fly off, if he's scared, uh, anytime he does fly off and he's nervous, I make sure that he comes and seeks me out and finds me, or I walk part way to him and have him walk part way to me. But it's an invitation that, hey, I do want you to pick me up, I do want to interact with you, and I kind of wait for those invitations. Um, a lot of you had also suggested doing target training, and the reason target training wasn't an option is because Bean came to me completely full. He's free fed, so he's almost always full. Um, I would have had to wait a really long time to get him to not only take a treat, but to also target train him because he doesn't know what that even means. So I would have had to been able to actually teach him what targeting was, which is why it was not an option. He was so fearful that I don't think any sort of treat reward would have been worth it to overcome the fear. So that's the main reason I could not use target training on that day one. So one thing that I wanted to talk about that was really hit on in the comments was how many of you wanted me to play SpongeBob SquarePants for Bean um, or sing to him or whatever. And the reason that I don't do those things is because I don't take them as fact. So I realized in the comments and the reason that I asked the questions I did in my part one video was to see where everybody's at. What would the general population do in the same situation? Um, because it kind of fills in the gaps for me and teaches me where I need to educate people or what kind of information I need to share more of and, and all the things. And so what I realized is that a lot of people would have resorted back to whatever the previous owner said as fact. He loves SpongeBob SquarePants. He loves singing. Um, and those that's anthropomorphizing. So somebody thinking that he loves singing might actually get him heightened and cause aggression. So I don't wanna do something from the previous home that I know gets some sort of reaction. I've never seen it. Um, so I don't actually know if I take that as truth that he actually enjoys it or it might actually over heighten him and over stimulate him which leads to the face biting she had told me about or leads to why he hates men. Maybe it was a man that played that for the first time and it's actually an aggressive response that looks really playful. You don't really know and that's why I choose not to re-trigger things I know have sparked previous behaviors. So if it happened on its own, of course, that's one thing. But for me to intentionally try to trigger those things that were from the previous home just isn't in my best interest of setting a new standard, setting a new relationship with him, and figuring out what makes him tick and what he likes and doesn't like. There were times um, that I'm documenting over on Patreon where I felt like, no, no, you can't possibly be ready to progress to that. And everything in his body language disagreed with where I emotionally was like, I don't think that you're ready for that. You shouldn't be ready for that. Yet he was, and he expressed to me through his body language super obviously that he was. And so I just learned to listen to him and do that. And then it paid off and he really was ready for that step. And it was amazing. Um, so he really tells me at what pace to go. 
Um, but I did want to just, I guess, make it clear that that day one is so important and it's so misunderstood. I feel like a lot of the times bird owners spend so much time and put so much emphasis on what can I give the bird that it used to have in its old home to make it happy in mine versus coming up with your own. What can you better in that bird's life? How can you get it to overcome the fear of its brand new giant cage versus starting off in its small one that it's used to? Just try to find ways to help the bird through the fear versus recognizing that, oh, the bird's scared, let's take all the scary stuff away. That's not how you overcome fear. You don't over overcome fear by avoiding fear. Uh, you overcome fear by working through it and becoming brave and realizing that is not something to be scared of. It has, there's no justification in being scared of whatever it is. Um, and I think that's where the real growth comes from and that's where birds learn to adapt to their environment a lot better. But if you're constantly removing things that could be deemed scary, you're never working through the actual root of the problem, which is the fear. I have not encountered a project bird where I have wanted to leave him in the cage to get used to things because that can potentially increase his phobias and make him cage bound where he learns that only the cage is a safe spot, people are scary, the environment's scary, and now he doesn't want to come out. So I know that there's a lot of people that experience this where their birds don't want to come out of the cage because everything is terrifying and then their experience when they're forced out of the cage is equally terrifying. So that's another thing that I really didn't want to do. So a lot of you that were telling me that I should should put him in a cage to relax and settle in and all of that jazz, that's how that can bite you in the butt later by teaching the bird that you included in that environment are also scary. I want to make sure that I emphasize how well intentioned I know Laura was and other owners are when they do have to rehome. So that's something that I don't want to get lost in all of this is that they do have the best intentions. but. Sometimes what we as humans interpret as our birds loves or dislikes or preferences aren't always accurate and it can take an outside eye to really say, hey, I think I see this. Um, have you ever noticed that it's this response instead of the one that you're creating? A lot of the times we hear what we want to hear, we see what we want to see, and we really need to uh, refocus when it comes to our birds so that we can make sure that we're interpreting it as they are interpreting it. The other part of this is taking everything that the previous owners say as 100% truth. This is a mistake that I've made in consults before when people tell me certain truths about their bird and then I'm working from assumption that they are correct. And I have to say, no offense all of you watching that have done consults with me, but most of the time what somebody describes an animal's problem as being is not actually the problem that the animal is having. And so I just take it as a human's interpretation of what they see in an animal. I don't take it as 100% truth. And I noticed that in a lot of the comments, you guys were. And I just think that that is a mistake. It's something that you need to actually test and see for yourself, especially because my environment is different from Laura's. So maybe, just by chance, he does really love SpongeBob SquarePants at her house in her environment, but in mine, it may not see stay the same and be 100% truth. It's kind of like her, if she would have claimed, hey, he loves head scratches, but then from a man, he doesn't. So it's no longer about the head scratch, it's about the environment encompassing that head scratch or that behavior. So there's a lot of different variants and elements that play roles in those behaviors of getting them to be successful or not, which is why a lot of people succeed or fail when they get a new bird and the owner says, oh, he loves this, and the new owner tries it and doesn't have success and wonders, what am I doing wrong? I tried offering the thing that you said he loved and it's not working. It's not working because you have a completely different environment and not all the variables are identical, which is why you really need to pave your own path and find your own way. And 
when something isn't working, you need to work through it, not backtrack and make it easier. That's kind of like telling the animal that instead of having to learn A, B, and C, if you don't learn A, we'll just go back and make it easier. And so they learn not to try because you'll just constantly go back and make it easier. We want to teach birds to problem solve and be independent and not be 100% reliant on a human for their entertainment. We want them to be able to, of course, have an amazing relationship and a bond with us, but also function as a bird, as a baseline, enjoy bathing, enjoy a healthy food. I really want you to get awesome at flying. Um, and just the basics of things like that, not uh, fear basic things in the home, not fear a carrier, a travel carrier, um, not fear men, you know, things that are just going to come into the environment randomly and um, and just all the time because that's usually a family dynamic is there's a man in the house. So I don't want Bean to be fearful of that and the result isn't make my husband go away, it's work through that fear and teach him that men aren't so bad. Men aren't so bad at all. Huh. Just, just pet me. Just be quiet and pet me. One of the things that I think gets skipped on my day one videos is the attention that people pay to diet. And for some reason on this day one video, it did get everybody's attention. Uh, maybe because I spent more time on it. But the main reason that I didn't go slowly is because Bean's pace were, with food conversion wasn't slow. He actually switched over with no problem and no issue and I was able to weigh him to make sure of that. So I didn't have to revert back to his old diet because he took to the new one so easily and so well that I felt really good about it. Also he had never been on a pellet, he was only on a seed diet, so I didn't feel guilty not having him have a pellet initially. I didn't prioritize that as much as I did my fresh seasonal feeding system. System because he then took to my birdie bread really easily which was the secondary part of his pellet transition for the second part of his diet transition. Now some birds you do have to take it slow. You gotta slowly mix the old diet with the new diet. I have pellet conversion guides and seed to pellet conversion guides and pellet to pellet conversion guides and all sorts of conversion guides that talk about taking it real slow. The reason that most people have to take it slow is because they didn't do it right from day one. Um, so a lot of the time that you have to take it slow is because it's a learned behavior of I get the same food in any environment that I'm in and you haven't made it interesting enough to try the new foods. So a diet conversion should never be taken lightly as far as you don't want to just wait for the bird to be so hungry that it's going to eat whatever you put in front of it, that's not the way to go. A lot of birds will starve themselves versus eat what you put in front of them. However, you can get creative. I had to do a lot of diet conversions and so I know how to get creative with the diet and try to set myself and the bird up for success to really switch and make it a smooth transition like it was for Bean. However, that said, my diet conversion for Sunny, which I helped Dave with, with his Project Bird Sunny, was entirely different from beans. So they don't all go the same way. Uh, I just want to reiterate that, but there are different methods and different ways that you can convince birds to eat healthy. I promise there are ways to do it. <laughs> and it's something I'm very passionate about doing correctly. Uh, I really feel birds should be on the healthiest diet possible and you should do everything you can to get them off the seed diet. Every single animal and bird that I work with will be different. No diet conversion will be identical. No way that I get a bird over to overcome certain fears will be identical. I'll use the same technique, but how I go about it is going to be entirely different based on the pace of that bird and its natural likes and dislikes and its learned behavior in the past as well. Um, but I really try to have a clean slate and work from and work from that clean slate and build on my own solid foundation. And if I learn later down the road that one of those things from the old home is not a trigger and it's actually a, uh, something that is positive behavior, then awesome. But I would hate to start off on the wrong foot by incorporating all the things that I take as truths that may not be truths um, and applying those first thing to my own situation. You know, I think that's why birds have learned behavior behavior and get really set in their ways is they do start to develop these expectations in certain homes where they get passed from home to home because everybody responds to the screaming identically and so the bird just won't learn any different because it's never been tried any differently. Um, 
And I think that that just sets a lot of birds up for failure. So it's something that I try to be really mindful and careful of. So anyways, I didn't want you guys to feel like I was ignoring your comments. So many of you were just kind of echoing the same thing over and over and over again. And I guess I felt like I apparently haven't done a good enough job explaining why I do the things that I do on day one. If you want to check out more of my day one videos with different birds from an Indian ringneck to a Quaker parrot to, uh, gosh, a Kaique parrot to a macaw <laughs> um, to an Alexandrian parakeet, you can check out some day one links in this video description that I will leave to you. Um, and if you missed part one or part two to Bean's first day, y'all will of course leave that in the video description as well. But just kind of wanted to, I guess, give a little bit more in-depth explanation be behind why I make the choices that I do and why every journey is just a little bit different with each and every bird because they say different things. They go at different paces and all that stuff and that's okay. I don't know. I guess hopefully nobody's too pissed at me, but sure seemed like it. So there's that. But um, honestly, I believe in my methods. I see the results in the birds that I work with, and I feel like he's doing pretty awesome and okay for how scared he started out. So I'm going to say that day one wasn't traumatic. Oh, the other part that I wanted to address was that people were, oh, yeah, petting time. People were not super happy that I took apart the cage to get Bean out, and they wanted to know, like, why couldn't I have been more patient and just, like, waited and waited and waited. The thing that I saw with Bean and why I made that decision was because he was showing incredibly anxious behavior inside the carrier. He was actually biting at his own nails and his own uh, toes and showing such anxious behavior that I felt like there was no way he was going to come out on his own. Um, Nothing provoked him to really even get away from that side of the cage for a long time. And so when I saw that body language, I realized, okay, well, I could probably take the top off. I thought it would go a little smoother, but I totally forgot about the front door that slammed and scared him. Uh, so that was definitely my bad. But the reason that I went ahead with that was because I figured I could undo whatever kind of scary experience that was going to be. I could build upon it and work through it and make sure that you were happy with me because I would have the entire day to do so. If I would have waited until the evening till maybe he even cared about getting a treat or something and was trying to bribe his way out of it, by the time I would have got him out of the carrier, if it took all day, I would have had no time to actually work on my relationship and work on building something together. And so I didn't want to not have time to do that because I figured I could use all the time I could get. Um, so that's why I made the decision that I did. So no, it wasn't perfect. Maybe there would have been an easier way. At the time, I felt like that was the best decision I had. Definitely could have made it go smoother. Uh, <laughs> but that's why the reasoning that I had in my head of why I made the decision that I did about the carrier. All right, should we go eat? You ready to go eat? You're not ready. You want to just stay here, film videos all day? Anyways, if you guys want to see a bunch of his bathing progression and aviary progression and desensitization progression and pooping, um, check him out on Patreon. He's made a ton of progress so far and patrons are getting a whole bunch of videos on him plus behind the scenes of Sunny, who is Dave's project bird who will be public here on YouTube. Bean. Yeah. We gonna go have dinner? We're gonna go have dinner. See ya. We're gonna go have dinner. <laughs>